this week. We're talking RV Tech Talk, and I have Chris Dougherty today with me. Uh, Dustin and Ashley are uh, out celebrating, and Zach's running the fort out there, so we got a hold of Chris. And some of you might remember Chris from the uh, the past. Chris, you did quite a few articles, technical articles for RV Travel. I mm -hmm. met you first when you were back um, the technical advisor for Motorhome Magazine and Trailer Life, I believe, mm -hmm. um, with Bob Livingston and and uh, those guys out there. And uh, so, tell us what give me give us a little bit of background about yourself and and what you're up to now. Uh, thanks, Dave. Yeah, well, thank you for having me on and uh, uh, seeking me out here. This is great. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've been um, the. When I, I used to work uh, with Chuck a long time ago doing uh, articles here, uh, FMCA and whatnot, um, and then uh, I got hired as the technical editor for Motorhome and Trailer Life, which I did for a number of years until the pandemic uh, when the, the two magazines um, were combined. And uh, so I've done, uh, I was the tech editor or uh, technical advisor for um, uh Bob uh, Bob uh, Livingston and Bruce uh, started a new magazine, uh, RV Enthusiast, so I worked for them. Um, uh, RV Business Magazine, and uh, uh, and I'm back with FMCA now, doing some things with uh, um, Family RVing, and I teach a lot. I teach RV technicians, and I do seminars across the country for the, on the consumer side. Yeah. So I've been keeping pretty busy, and I still turn wrenches a little bit here and there so good uh, well i gotta say that stuff. you know for for many many years rv uh the motorhome magazine and the trailer life magazine were the go-to source of information mm -hmm. um you know there was there was a lot of new product stuff and all that other things out there you know but uh there was a lot of good technical information and and um you, you guys were that and you worked for bob the self-proclaimed God's gift to RVs. <laughs> I worked with them. Well, too. I know, I know you spent your time, Dave, uh, with Good Sam. And uh, you know, when I got uh, asked to do that job, it was uh, for me kind of the Mount Everest of, of uh, you know, positions in this business. And and I was really honored to have it uh, while I did. Yeah. And um, uh, you know, the tech part of it, I know, you know, our readers really appreciate the the tech information. And, uh, you know, the, the media has changed quite a bit. There's a lot of different things out there now. So, uh, yeah, well, and, and we've we've talked about that many times, uh, you know, here within RV travel and the, you know, the state of the RV industry today is there's so much information all over the place with, mm -hmm. on the Internet. But, you know, what can you trust? Um, you know, that that's the hard part. And that's that's where, you know, what I like about RV travel, it's RVers. It's technicians, it's certified, you're certified, which uh, brings up another point. I think you had kind of an unusual um, group of students down in some place, wasn't it? Uh, that uh, kind of a captive audience. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I, I, am, uh, I do some training with the RV Technical Institute. And so last year I was uh, an adjunct uh, with them. And at the same time, I've been running one of three uh, programs in the country that work with uh, people who are in jail, who are incarcerated, uh, and who are training to have a new life when they come out of uh, incarceration. I've been working here in Massachusetts with, with the Worcester County Sheriff's Office. And so not only working in the, in the House of Corrections um, and doing programs in there for low risk um, uh, inmates who are going to be released in relatively short order, uh, but I've also been working in their outreach program. So uh, the sheriff in Worcester County is very proactive and uh, so they have several um, outreach centers where they do career training and things like that. We're also working with mass hires um, to bring more people in to do uh, RV technician level one and hopefully level two training. Uh, so that we're doing that here, uh, which is, um, you know, so far it's been working out pretty well. And yep. we also do some work uh, with the uh, PRVCA, the Pe Pennsylvania RV and Camping Association. I'll be doing some level one and level two training with them also. Yeah, you know, what a what a great win win situation. You know, the RV industry needs technicians. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, selling six hundred thousand RVs last year, and 
you know, I mean, you can't keep up with the technicians in it. And that's, uh, you know, a great opportunity to give these guys a trade uh, and gals. I think uh, mm -hmm. I saw one group was the late just recently was uh, ladies penitentiary mm -hmm. somewhere, women's. And in so, Texas. Yep. Yeah. So that, that's that's great. So we've got a whole bunch of people that come in. Uh, one of the things that uh, Dave Talenko has here is uh, what are we giving away today, Chuck? Do you have any um, product out there and a hashtag or something like that? So if you do, let's post that up there. I guess that's something that normally Ashley takes care of that. And like I say, she's she's out gallivanting around. So we're uh, we're winging it ourselves here. But I I see Dave Talenko's here. Mark Britt is uh, from Georgia. We've got uh, Ken. Uh, some of our our uh, our standbys here. We have no questions that have come in yet, but, uh, oh, here we do. Okay. Um, right here. I have, well, gentlemen, I wanted to know, can you use Dicor RV roof protectant on the lap seal edges? Will it harm it or offer UV protection? So uh, Chris, have you used the Dicor product before? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, it's absolutely fine. It's not going to hurt anything at all. Um, the uh, as far as offering UV protection depends on the protectant that you're using, right? Whether they whether it offers UV protection or not, um, but uh, it should help to to protect it a little bit, sure. Yeah. But it won't harm it for for certain. Right, and and Dicor has um, you know this this is their typical lap seal, and it's a self leveling lap seal. Um, I don't think that this has much UV protection in it. Uh, it's just a sealant, you know, and, mm -hmm. and sealant is going to dry up. It's going to, you know, weather check over a, a period of time. And then the Dicor mm -hmm. product, I think he's talking about is that two step where you've got the first one is a cleaner conditioner. And then the second one's a roll on that. That does have a, a little bit. Uh, I still don't think it's, you know, a, a, as much of a UV protection. They're calling it a roof protection. Uh, mm -hmm. from the sun but i you know i don't i don't know that it's specifically um you know roof but you're right you're not you're not gonna um gonna harm it in any way so chuck says that we do not have a prize today because ashley um knows how to do that and we don't so, so <laughs> if you put hashtag chuck and send an email to him he's gonna send you all some money no <laughs> and i don't know how many like a dime maybe or something like that you can get in there so we've got uh the comments come in so we got Corey from uh jacksonville florida i bet it's a lot warmer there than it is here we had um we had some pretty nice days I, i'm northern iowa so we were in the uh, 40s for a while which is unusual and then today it dropped down into it was 10 this morning and uh, i think it got maybe up to 18 so it was like Ugh, that was that was not very fun well, so here, here in Massachusetts, it was 69 degrees when I went out to my truck, uh, when I left uh, the, the Eastern States Exposition today, we have the Springfield RV show coming up this weekend. So we're setting up for it. Ah, and uh, yeah, uh, it was, it, it's quite warm here. Are you doing seminars at that show? I am. Good, good. I mean, I'll be in Harrisburg next weekend. Um, we start Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday this year. And we've got three stages, actually. We got uh, Harold and uh, his wife are doing one stage. I'm doing another. And then we've got some, uh, I think, the local um, park, state park and, and national park. Uh, people are going to be talking there as well. So there we got a guy. Look at this. Hashtag Chuck. So get, <laughs> you, get your billfold ready, Chuck. Uh, I do have a question that came in, and you and I talked a little bit about it. I think it's a very interesting one is uh, we've got a gentleman that has about 600 watts, I believe, of solar panel power. He's got a 60 amp charge con controller for that solar panel. Then he's got a 50 amp plug in. You know, when he plugs into shore power, he's got a converter. Uh, and he didn't state whether he had a converter or inverter converter. I'm, I'm assuming inverter charge. that big of a unit, probably inverter charger, in, they call them. And then uh, he's wondering so, what keeps all these things from charging at one time? You know, you got your outside mm -hmm. with solar panel. And you've plugged into, um, you know, your your 50 amp or even a 30 amp service, your controller, uh, or you start your generator. It does have an automatic switch. What keeps, you know, th that thought from some people is that, well, I'm going to get 
13.6 or 14.6, whatever it is out of the solar panels. But then when I'm plugged in, I'm also going to get another 13 or 14. Am I going to be at 28, 29? And so I'll let you handle that one. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. And I can understand people, you know, not being sure about that. So basically what's happening is, is that you're, you know, you're looking at voltage versus amps and, and voltage amps and watts, right? So uh, the voltage is based on the charger itself. So in, when you've got 600 watts of solar on the roof and you're coming down to, I think you said it was a uh, uh, 30 watt, um, 60. 60 watt charge controller. Yep. Um, so the, which is which is fine and what that's doing any of these smart chargers what they're doing is they're looking for voltage right and so they're going to say okay so the the batteries have gotten down to a certain level and i'm going to charge into them right when you've got lithium it char changes a little bit because lithium the profile of a lithium battery is that it keeps a a, a very high voltage rate right to the point where the battery is discharged and then it'll turn itself off. That's when it has determined, when the battery management system's determined that it has uh, depleted the battery. But uh, to answer your, your question more directly is you're not gonna over volt the system. So you're gonna have different sources that can provide that. Uh, we'll, we'll just round it off to 14 uh, volts DC uh, to the batteries. It's gonna be a little bit more. You're gonna have a smart charger, it may be a multi-stage type charger um, and it changes a little bit when you've got lithium batteries but they're going to balance each other out now a good way of really fixing that is to have a dedicated dc to dc charger on the battery so if you have multiple sources coming in and this is something similar with um, there's some uh, inverters uh, inverter chargers out there that are actually have multiple inputs okay so you can put a uh, you can put your solar in through the unit uh, your uh, your shore power uh, when the shore power comes on it's going to have a charger in it and so it, these things will decide uh, how much charge is going to go to the batteries and it doesn't matter whether it's a you know if you're if it's a towable let's say you got a fifth wheel whatever the charge coming from the tow vehicle is uh, and from the inverter charger from the solar a dc to dc charger element will balance all that out and make sure that the batteries are getting the best the best charge so there's a couple of different ways of attacking that but uh, even so without a dc to dc charger it's not going to over you know volt the system yep no great answer okay we have marcia uh she's got a 2022 keystone fifth wheel the leaf springs are rather flat reading about breakage should we just change them out and that's a pretty new you know, 2022, I mean, it could be a year and a half old, almost two years old. Now we see 2024s being offered at some of the, you know, the shows coming out, which is, is a little crazy. But, uh, you know, what's, what's your thought on that? Well, the first thing that I always go to when someone brings up something about suspension and springs and they're concerned about the springs being flat or whatnot, first thing I always ask is, is has the vehicle been weighed? Okay, so to make sure that you're within uh, the uh, weight ratings for the vehicle, so the gross vehicle weight rating, the axle ratings, and so forth. If you're there, uh, if you're within those limits, um, it just depends on whether you have a handling issue really with the trailer or not. One of the things that can cause the springs to flatten out a little bit is wear on the moving parts of the suspension. So a lot of trailers are shipped with non-greasable um, spring bolts okay and they'll have a neoprene uh, washer in basically a sleeve inside that wears down pretty quickly usually after a season or so that neoprene wears out and then you've got metal on metal and if it isn't a greasable bolt there's no way of putting lubrication into it so as time goes on when you have the weight of the trailer bouncing down the road whatever else and it's wearing metal on metal your spring shackles, everything else are going to start to elongate. Those holes are going to open up both on the spring shackles themselves and then back on the uh, equalizer, okay, in the center. I've seen those where like the center bolt hole for the equalizer is elongated by like an inch, right? Because it just wears and wears and wears on it. Nobody ever does it. So if you're concerned about that, I would get an axle service 
and have them, once it's up in the air, they can kind of work with the axle a little bit and just see if those are loose. And if, the, and if they are, and I suspect that may be the case, even with a 2022, um, that you replace that with greasable bolts. Now, um, depends on which Keystone fifth wheel you have. Um, uh, Montana, usually it comes with greasable bolts, uh, but other brands, other you know, makes within the line may not have that from the factory. So it's something to take a look at, get that serviced and checked out yep. and, uh, you know, make sure you're in alignment and then you won't have tire wear and that type of thing also. Cause that's another kind of result result of, um, you know, having that bolt wear. Right. And, and I think an excellent point, you know, the weight is the first thing, especially with those fifth wheels. And I don't think just swapping out the leaf springs is going to do much good because a year from now, you're going to have the same thing. You got to find out what's what's causing that. So, you know, a lot of those uh, Montana fifth wheels come with the Moride um, mm -hmm. and even even up a little bit. But usually that's that's an option, um, you know, that that comes mm -hmm. up to a certain point and then it's standard, you know, when you get up into the, the higher line stuff. But I have mm -hmm. seen, you know, and we've talked about this several times uh, in our shows and the articles that when you see units sitting side by side at a show or on the lot and one's five thousand dollars or ten or twenty or thirty you know there's something in there that you mm -hmm. got to find out what's you know causing that and i would say by just going up to those those the better um you know in um more ride and, and others like that mm -hmm. you could be talking somewhere in the three to four grand um you know by the time you do you know you could you could be and that's and that's always an upgrade you can do right so uh, a Moride uh, suspension upgrade. I, I don't know, Lippert's got uh, suspension upgrades that are available also um, yep. with the cushioned uh, equalizer. Uh, you can put shock absorbers on. There's different different things you can do, but uh, we did a project uh, with Trailer Life where we went to Moride in Elkhart and did a, an upgrade on a Coleman travel trailer. And uh, it really isn't that, you know, wasn't that expensive, but we were able to take the, the you know, kind of failed... Uh, you know, dry suspension system and bolts mm -hmm. and whatever and replace it and then put the equalizer, um, the uh, SRE 3000, I think it was, in yep. there. And uh, it makes a big difference. Well, and and I, if you look back at some of the articles we had, we did have one of our readers <clears throat> wrote in and, and actually sent pictures of the elongated holes in that that had, you know, it was a little older than a year old, but uh, mm -hmm. they were having some real problems with the same, same kind of thing. So... So Debbie Perfect. here has, uh, do you recommend six volt? And I think she's referring to AGM. Um, she put AIM, AIMs, but uh, absorb glass mat in place of 12 volt uh, wet batteries. And I guess it's kind of a Ford versus Chevy debate sometimes. Uh, I think, but go ahead and hit, hit that one, Chris. So, uh, so the, in general, what six volt batteries are going to do for you, if you're looking at um, uh, lead, uh, flooded lead acid batteries, right? FLA batteries is six volts are going to have thicker plates. They're going to give you a little bit more amp hour capacity than the standard uh, 12 volt uh, deep cycle batteries are going to do for you. Uh, when you get up into um, the uh, AGM batteries, six volt versus 12 volt, I'm not sure what the effect is going to be for that technology i assume it's the same but i actually have never researched that particular thing i don't know dave if you've ever played with that yeah um you know the the agm battery you really have to look at how you're rving you know and, and what kind of battery capacity you need and how long you're going to be out and you know we've gone through that many many times but in you know in my opinion the the six volt batteries you're right you you got more plates that they, they have more cycles available so they're going to last a lot longer time but and the advantage of going with the agm six volt batteries is that you have less sulfation you know mm -hmm. the, the regular flooded lead acid battery it, it sulfur attacks the plates as you drain them down and you know if you don't have a multi-stage charger that just gets thicker and thicker and thicker and and you know we did a video um actually for um bob out out there and i think you were around at the time when we started to do those uh, abcs of rvs videos for um trailer life and, and such and we had a brand new fleetwood discovery that we got from a dealership as a demo to work on it and we went through and it had four six volt 
lead acid batteries in there and all of them were were shot hadn't even mm -hmm. been sold yet it's just you know they didn't plug it in they it sat at the manufacturer until the dealer bought it sat at the dealership and then you know no they never plugged it in and so you know there's there's some maintenance that's required with those lead acids and the and the agm is gonna you know do do a little bit better of, of a of a job for it uh mm -hmm. you know, you, you're not going to double you, you have no more advantage in in amp hours going from 12 to you know six you're going to take and you have to have two of the sixes so mm -hmm. you got to work them in series positive to negative so you're still going to have whatever group you buy you're still going to have that um you know that that amp amp hours i guess for it so it's going to take mm -hmm. more room and yeah, so it and, really and, depends and, on... and you can look at the ratings of the batteries too. So, yep. um, you know, make sure, you know, when you're shopping for the batteries, you're looking at, at saying, okay, so if I take, you know, two six volt batteries, I wire them in series, my, uh, I'm increasing the voltage, but the amp hour stays the same. So if I'm buying, I don't know, 105 amp hour, six volt battery, if I buy two of them, I'm going to have 12 volts, you know, in average, but it's going to be, um, you know, uh, still 105. Yeah. You know, and keep in mind, whether it's 12 volt or six volt, you only get about 50% of that. You know, it's with, yes, with lead technology, that is correct. And that's one of the big, uh, pluses to the lithium iron phosphate technology that's out there today Yep, is that you end up with, uh, about 98% usable, um, energy capacity out of the batteries. Yep. And they also have a much longer lifespan. So even though they're more expensive to start with, for sure, uh, you're going to replace a, uh, like, th I remember calculating out before, it was something like three sets of lead batteries um, for one set of, of, uh, of lithium. Yeah. And, well, uh, and most of your really good lithium, like XPN 360, I've got one of those, where is it, right behind me here, <laughs> and two of them on the floor that we pulled out of the Thor, they have a 10-year warranty. I mean, mm -hmm. we never saw that, you know, when the lead lead acids were coming out, and uh, you know, they're they're not as susceptible to that. There is no sulfation in them, and so you're right. You you go out and buy, um, you know, to get the same 100 amp, you're going to have to have 200 amp hours of a six volt AGM. That means four batteries, mm -hmm. and you know, you're you're talking probably somewhere in the vicinity of, you know. If you're lucky to get them under $175 a piece, I, I think, you know, that's that's pretty pretty average mm -hmm. price. So you're almost at that thousand dollar range, and they're probably going to be needed to be replaced in three to three to four years. Mm -hmm. Yep. And okay. and if you if you're in a cold climate and you put your RV in storage and you let them freeze, which is a problem we have up here, um, you know, a lot of people. They store their RV. They don't take care of the batteries, whatever the deal is. And there, we had people replace their batteries every single year uh, yep. when I was at the dealership. And you know, we sold thirty. This was a number of years ago, but thirty-five grand worth of batteries a, a year. Yeah. And um, a lot of that were people with motorhomes that were just changing them out every year because yep. they weren't, you know, keeping them charged and protecting them from freezing. One of the things I would recommend, Debbie, um, if you're looking to buy some new batteries, go to go powers site it's gpelectric.com mm -hmm. and they have a great calculator that says how long you're going to be out um you know the appliances that you're going to use the 12 volt draw that you have it's really hard to to actually you know it's not an exact science saying i'm going to need exactly this amount of battery power but at least it gets you thinking about how long you're going to run the lights how long you're going to do certain things and so um, you know, that calculator kind of helps get you thinking in the in the idea of, you know, how, how long am I going to dry camp? And so it's a, it's a really good exercise. So the next one, then we've got Ken um, is doing he's purchased his Montana and it is a uh, 3791 RD already had to replace the water pump due to leaking. Is there any advantage to a variable speed volume R RV water pump that I've read about? Um, you know, I'm going to pull this thing up right here i mean this is the typical sure flow that we've used for you know many 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 years i have had very few problems with these um unless i let it freeze mm -hmm. you know that's the only thing in in our areas here you know a lot of people go in and 
uh, they decide to blow the system out with water, you know, with a compressed air and they blow all the water, they open all the drains and everything. They don't realize that you've got that line coming into the pump and the line going out that has water you have to get out of there and you let that freeze and it will crack that housing mm -hmm. um, or, or the, you know, the, the connectors coming to it. Um, so I am not, you know, the variable speed, I'm, I have not seen, you know, Flowjet, uh, SureFlow. I've got one sitting right over here. I don't think any of them that I've seen are variable speed. Are you familiar with those? Yeah, there's some up, upgraded models that will give you that that will ramp up in speed. It's con controlled by a microprocessor, so SureFlow has one. Uh, I can see if I can it can find it, but there's there's a couple of different ones out there, and um, so there's a couple of things you got to think about when you're putting those in. And I've done those upgrades before. Uh, they do require more amperage than the um, three or four diaphragm model that. Um, uh, we had up here, you know, a couple minutes ago. So usually requires putting in a relay, running a new dedicated power line back to your power source, uh, to your batteries or whatnot with, you know, uh, circuit protection, that type of thing. Uh, it'll give you uh, a lot better flow. It'll give mm -hmm. you better pressure for sure, but they're expensive, but mm -hmm. it is something to take a look at. I've done it and I had a Monaco motorhome years ago that I put one in and was very pleased with the with the result, uh, you end up with less uh, surging and that type of thing. Back then, the standard pump was the three diaphragm, like your SureFlow or whatnot, or FlowJet. Um, then they came out with the four diaphragm, which does have a relief valve or a, a bypass valve built into it. So it's designed to reduce the um, uh, the surging and, and whatnot. So it's uh, small flow amounts it'll let water bypass within the, the head of the pump. Right. Um, but I don't think any of those are going to do anything for leaking. You know, they're not going to do it. No, leaking, leaking is a, a, is a different thing, right? So it's damaged to the pump. Somehow the screws could be loose that hold the whole head of the pump together. Somebody had it apart, something like that. I've had those sure flow ones go bad if they froze or there was a little piece of plastic. So any of these pumps are diaphragm pumps, right? So, they use like a silicone uh, or neoprene diaphragm inside with these little things that turn and that's what creates your mm -hmm. your suction and then your pressure. Well, if the, the they're, they sit in little plastic circles, okay? And they have little, you know, separators between them and where I've seen those go bad is that cracks. So you get the, you know, you get freezing in there. And so sometimes the, the pump pack, packing itself goes bad which is easily re replaced. You can replace any of these parts, mm -hmm. but the pump head itself um, has, if it cracks, well, it's probably just better to get a new pump because then you're you're kind of getting around that, uh, you know, the, the, the parts in the housing there. So here is... <clears throat> That's the, the replacement kit for the bigger pump. That's the pump he's talking about. So what's the model on that? Uh, it Dave? says here, and this is just a replacement valve for a does not say okay uh, that's the smart sensor 5.7 or the smart sensor 4.0 it looks like yeah that's what he's talking about is the smart sensor so that's what that one is designed for okay it's a it's a bigger pump yeah the 590 x series yep and that is so it's a good that's pump. kind of a a breakdown of there you go that's it exactly yep. what that looks like so the, this is this is the upgrade version of, of chris's graphic of <laughs> yeah i know right <laughs> how can i do this i don't have one of those handy but no i know um, I, I, dustin gets a kick out of it whenever somebody mentions something and i feel like i've got peabody's um I've, I've probably have a, a sure flow um catalog over there but i'm, I'm i won't walk away just to to go yeah, that's get it, right. but. Okay, so now we've got uh, Michael said he attended my seminar at the Tampa Super Show. I did one seminar a day. I did the RV buyers seminar uh, throughout the show. It was my first year down there. It was kind of fun to be on there. He says he's on the road and usually have poor Wi-Fi, so he could not see uh, on the Wednesdays. And uh, so one of the things I, I wanted to bring up is that tonight and last week, um, when we or not the week before, we went live from. Uh, from Orlando, uh, I used the Travelfy hotspot 
that uh, it takes the top five or six cell phone that what they've done is they went out and bought all this data from the top five or six cell phone providers. So you've got T-Mobile and Verizon and all these other people. And then wherever you're at, it takes the strongest signal and, and you buy the data that you want for that. And we had such horrible uh, Wi-Fi that at the uh, resort we were staying at because it was Disney people, you know, and all the kids were whatever they were doing. And and uh, so I, I do want to thank Travelfy and I hooked it up tonight just to see how it was working again. And uh, it, it's one of the best hotspots that that I've seen around the country. So, you know, if you're looking to upgrade your your Wi-Fi uh, issues on the road and we all know you go into a campground, if you're not 50 feet from the, you know, the campground office and the modem thing normally isn't going to work. Uh, so we got Snoopy's back here. Um, I thought that multiple charging sources that your system chose the highest voltage. So, uh, Chris, I'll let you address that. Uh, generally, the highest voltage is going to be the one that wins out. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, let's see. And, and Snoopy, I just emailed you back. You had something. I don't remember offhand what it was. Um, I had to, Oh, your, your Zamp. Um, not Zamp, Go Power, and uh, I did get a hold of the technician from Go Power. And since you've got six of the ports to hook up to, that you can go. Um, he wants to put, I believe it's 800 watts. Uh, right now, he's got a certain number of panels he wants to add to that, and they said to go with the 60 amp uh, MPPT charger because generally each one of those those panels will do about 20 amps amps watts 20 amps so anyway he said go with the 60 mppt so check check your emails uh snoopy we did get a hold of them so hopefully that'll help you out uh we're gonna go back to debbie says and a follow-up would i need four six volt batteries to replace two 12 volt batteries wet 100 amp hour batteries uh, yeah, so it depends on the amp the amp hour rating of the batteries, right? Right. So, um, you know, you've got to, when you shop the batteries, you're going to look and say, okay, how many amp hours at it? When you wire six volt batteries in series, you're doubling the voltage, but the amp hour stays the same. So if I'm going to look at six volt batteries and I know they're 100, and, uh, 100 amp hour batteries, uh, it will take two of those uh, to replace one, you know, 12 volt, 100 amp hour battery. You know, yep. so it's it, it's you know pretty easy to, to do the math there and figure right. that out. The one the one thing, and you said this a little earlier, is that normally six volt batteries you can get higher amp hour. You know, twelve volts kind of limit. They they have a cap of what you know they get to just because of the 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 plates the size of it. So the six mm -hmm. volt you can generally get a higher amp hour, but you got to get two. You know, so you mm -hmm. might get up into one hundred and eighty. I, th I think is yeah, if, the threshold. Yeah, if, one of the best resources that I found over the years is Trojan Battery. Yeah. Go to their website. Um, and uh, I used to know one of the uh, engineers over there, and uh, they have just some great technical and, and, and training resources, and, and they have all the, the data on their batteries and whatnot. And so even if you're not going to necessarily buy Trojan, you can, you know, there's any number of different brands that are out there, uh, well, but there's really good learning resources there. Yes. And, and I would, you know, we've, we've brought this up many times in articles and stuff too, is there's a lot of really cheap batteries out there that are, are, you're, you're not going to be happy with them. You know, you get to the big box stores, the, you know, the discount membership places that have the 8995 battery. And the only advantage of that is 8995. They have, mm -hmm. You know the plates aren't as thick. the The welds aren't very good. It's just a whole host of things that are are you know they're not designed to really last a long time in store. They're just a pretty basically a temporary battery. So Trojan's a great battery. Uh, we've I've done a lot of research on U.S. Battery does a good job with their stuff. Lifeline you, when you get into the AGMs and other stuff, and, and of course uh, Xpion. And I think now even Go Power is selling their own line of, of batteries, and and you know I've worked with them for the last six or seven years in the in the satellite satellite the solar panel uh, mm -hmm. product that they've had, and now they've gotten into batteries because you can have the best solar panels in the world, but if your batteries are no good, 
you know, so they, they've kind of protected themselves um, being able to sell batteries. Sure. Okay, so we have Timothy. Okay, toilet leaked too, ba too bad to repair after trying to take it about, do I need to Teflon the threads or use Teflon paste? So I think what he's saying is he completely replaced the toilet. Mm -hmm. Now he's looking at, uh, you know, hooking the water lines back mm -hmm. up. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of guessing the same thing. And to answer your question, no, you don't uh, need Teflon threads because the female uh, uh, PEX fitting that's going to go on to the back of the toilet has a rubber cone or neoprene cone inside that once you hand tighten it, uh, that's going to seal it. So you do not need uh, Teflon paste for that. However, uh, when you're putting the toilet down, make sure you use a new foam seal. Okay. It's like the wax ring. Okay. That we use in a house, but we don't use wax on the road, you know, for a lot of reasons. Um, so you're just going to, uh, make sure you use the new, new foam seal underneath it. Yeah. But that's all you have to do. It's real. Simple. I've got a peck somewhere. I just can't see it right now. <laughs> it, it's small. No, yeah, that, it's exactly right. Okay. So Corey's got a long one here. When it was close to 40 degrees several days ago, I tried to use a Dometic DFMD 3011 furnace. After I turned it on, the fan was blowing well. Several seconds into the cycle, I could hear the rumbling of the burner lighting. Then about five seconds, the burner would go out. The furnace would repeat this process multiple times until I shut it off. My research indicated either the flame sensor may be dirty, which is part of the furnace igniter, or the control board. Before I try to remove the ig, I think he ran out of space. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, uh, I'm going to hide this here, and then uh, I'll let you hit on that. And I'm going to look down and see if he added added any more. But go ahead and you know give your diagnosis of what's happening there. Well, when you're diagnosing a, an appliance um, that's doing something like that, there's the first thing that you've got to do is confirm the energy coming into the appliance, right? So, um, you know, any appliance, no matter what it is, is only as good as the energy coming into it. So your 12 volt DC power has to be good and your propane pressure has to be good. So you need to test those things first because it could be that your uh, propane regulator is out of adjustment. And so if there's not enough gas coming through, um, that, that can cause uh, that to happen. Again, the, the flame sense, uh, so there's a number of safeties uh, within the furnace, okay? So you have a flame sense. Uh, so it's trying to determine, okay, do I have ignition? So it senses that it's igniting and then it senses flame. And if it can't sense the flame, uh, then it's gonna shut off. It's going to use the fan to purge the burn chamber and it's gonna try it again, okay? It's gonna try to ignite again. And then what can cause it to, to turn off? Well, one is it doesn't have flame sense, right? So I can't tell whether uh, I have flame or not, so I'm not going to keep pumping gas into it. Second thing that can cause it to, to have a problem is that it overheats. Okay, so there's a thermistor on the burn chamber that if that overheats, it, it will also trip the system out. Okay, but it keeps the fan going. Again, it wants to exhaust um, the, the uh, uh, propane from the burn chamber. Uh, so you're, you're, you're close, uh, in that once I get to the point of, um, I, I know the propane pressure, uh, is at 11 inches of water column. I know we're good there. I know I've got, you know, you should be 12, you know, above 12 volts DC. So if you're plugged into shore power, your solar's on, you're going to be somewhere around 13.6 volts DC. Um, if you're there, you're probably fine. Um, and then you can start looking within the unit and you're just going to go kind of go through the sequence of operation. What is, um, you know, you can, you can, uh, at that point you can use a multimeter, try to determine, okay, what is tripping out in the unit? At what point is it, is it quitting? And that can help tell you, um, you know, is it a circuit board or is it the igniter, which is also the flame sense or is it something else? Yeah. And, and, you know, that's, we, we tell people, if you have sulfated batteries, you know, you may charge them up and they, they seem real good, but they have, they have the tendency to do this dropout thing. Like you talked mm -hmm. about it. Yep. And then we always tell somebody when you're running on an LP or whatever system, plug the unit in, verify you've got 13.2 at least coming from that, 
that converter and, and it would probably go 13.6 like you said if the battery mm -hmm. the batteries are low you have your your flame sensor but before i would get that far um you know you've got a sail switch on on the inside of this thing that the fans got to run fast enough to raise that sail switch and then you've got your overload temperature switch on the back side and what i've seen um, a lot of people will put rugs and stuff down inside their rv and they'll cover the vents in there mm -hmm. or the elephant trunks you know if you if you look at your um your typical let me see if i can find a picture here of the there we go you know a lot of your furnaces are going to have these type of supply lines that go to the vents and then you start putting stuff inside that couch storage wise and you crimp those those hoses then the airflow uh, is reduced and it will start mm -hmm. up and then once but if you don't get enough airflow going through there either the sail switch won't make its way up or that temperature switch mm -hmm. with the back pressure you know you know not being able to circulate stuff is is going to cause that to happen or mud daubers on the outside of the exhaust vent coming mm -hmm. in just a little bit of blockage so you know all that relates to what you said the the um, temperature sensor and and the sales switch but those before i start tearing into all that other stuff mm -hmm. and one good you know one way of testing somebody says well how do i know i have 11 inches of water column um you know that that's a pretty specific test that you wouldn't have the average rv owner do you wouldn't have the equipment to do it um but one of the things that that i've told people in the past and i, I probably got this from bob years ago is go in and turn on you know you've got a three burner range in most of these so turn the first burner on, turn the second burner on. You should get a little drop in flame, but it should come back up to that nice little blue um, steady flame. Turn the third, bur third burner on and uh, make sure you got your vent going because you're going to get a little bit of heat in that. But then go turn something on that that is like the water heater or the furnace or whatever. And if you see that, mm -hmm. you know, go down, then you know your, your regulator is not keeping up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's one of the gremlins that I call it in the appliance side of things is that, you know, you go out and you use it and it doesn't work and you bring it back to the dealership and they bring it inside this nice warm service center and they plug it into 30 amps and works fine. And then mm -hmm. they take it out and it does the same thing. Well, you, you aren't simulating the same scenario as you're out there because you don't know when that refrigerator cycling yeah, well, mm -hmm. the water heater might kick in at some point in time and cause some of the, some of those things. So, you know, that's that's where it's important. You know, like you said, if you can get in and specifically test the water column, you know, then yeah. then that's there is. Yeah, there is one other thing, uh, Dave, that is um, uh, we figured out in the shop not too long ago. Uh, the newer furnaces, the way the air intake and, dis and exhaust discharge work, you really have to have the door and the pipe in place. And there's also a plastic guard that goes behind the door. And what happens is if those aren't in the right position, it can take exhaust gas and bring it back into the air intake mm -hmm. and it suffocates the flame. And that is exactly what he's, uh, I think, talking about here, uh, too, yes. is, well, not that, not just that one. It's, it's actually the smaller square one where you have the uh, air oh. intake that comes in around the outside of the exhaust pipe itself. Yep. I have that on the other one, and that's too heavy to bring up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that that is uh, that's a, a common issue that we've run into on that one. So okay. uh, just checking the door to make sure it's tight and make sure the pipe is in and that the guards in place and whatnot. OK. And um, so one one of the things that I also look at is when you when you submit a question, um, also put what year and model the rig is, too. So it would be good to know how old that Dometic furnace was. You know, and that's the other thing I ask people when they send in a question, did it work before? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, so we can kind of maybe walk through what, what changed then, you know, was it temperature? Was it uh, whatever? So, um, whoops, I just. <laughs> yeah, I was feeling down. fine until I went out to shovel three feet of snow. <laughs> Oh, you only have three feet? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> no, it was 69 degrees here today, brother. Let me tell you. Ah. I've never seen that Never seen that before in uh, February. I went out to my truck, and there it was. 
Yeah. No, we had 50 or 40 and we were pretty happy the last few days. Supposed to get back up to 40 this weekend. So we're, we're looking forward to that. So Debbie then says, uh, can you recommend a manufacturer for lithium batteries? Um, you know, I, I have researched the XPN 360, you know, and what I would say, Debbie is, is look for the article on lithium batteries. We've got posted in here because you really want to find the good cells, the UL listing of it, the mechanical connections. You know, there's a, there's a lot of junk that's coming into the market that, it, you know, it just doesn't last and it's not going to hold up in the rigors of bouncing around the road. You want to, you, you, if it gets below freezing, you can't just charge it back up without a battery management system that's going to uh, you either have an internal heater or a blanket uh, pad like Xpion has. Battleborn, um, you know, Keystone is using Dragonfly, Battleborn. It's the same company that's their OEM versus retail. And uh, I've heard a lot of good things about them. Um, you know, what what companies have you worked with? Uh, Battleborn. Uh pretty extensively had really good um, outcomes with Battleborn, uh, Xantrex, uh, Lithionix. Um, I've worked with, you know, their, all, all their, their lithiums um, and it's been good. Yep. And I think most of those are running pretty close about the same price. You know, you, you, you're, you know, you can find a little bit of fluctuation in some of it, but you know, if you find those $499 um, 100 amp hour batteries, I would do some research. Definitely, yeah, uh, definitely, and 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 where you end up seeing the the higher uh, cost in in some of these like Lithionix or Xantrex or whatever is when they start having uh, more electronics in them, so that you can monitor them through an app or if they're even uh, you know internet connected in the RV, so that you can you know monitor your batteries from anywhere on the planet. Right, um, and the, and they have that internal battery management system, which they all do, uh, yeah. Yeah, which will make sure that for the most part, if if you don't have a heater built into that, you can't charge them up below zero or below freezing temperatures. Below, below freezing, yeah, you'll ruin them. And they have an overcharge, and you know, so they, they have a lot more management in it. So that's why they have a ten-year warranty mm -hmm. as well. Okay, and they're repairable. So you know, that's one of the things too. Is if a lithium battery goes bad, if I have a you know a battleborn battery or whatever. And I end up having a problem with it. I can send it back. They cut it open. They test all the cells. They fix the ones that are bad, replace them, whatever, mm -hmm. and put it in a new case and send it back to me. You know, yep. so it's not like if you have a failed, you know, FLA battery that you know you're whistling Dixie. Um, that's just not the case. You, yep. you know, there's there's things that can be done. Yep. So we have a Facebook user here. Is, is it okay for a TPO roof to have a one inch wide bubble across the width of the roof? <laughs> <laughs> well, ideally, no. no. Okay. However, um, what I would do is because, you know, cutting that and patching it and getting it back down, I mean, obviously the, the glue let go where that uh, bubble is. Um, and it's probably on a seam, you know, a, a, a plywood seam underneath, which is, you know, pretty common for where that happens. So uh, I would keep an eye on it and you know make sure your sealants are good and all that sort of thing and just make sure it doesn't get any bigger uh, i've seen rvs going down the road and some of our other full timers and stuff i'm sure i've seen the same thing where you see an rv going down the road and there's this huge bubble on the front of the rv because the it's up like a, a sail right uh, so you want to make sure that that is not uh, what's going to happen there yeah um, and if it starts getting worse then yes you're going to have to have it you yeah. know uh, looked at um, typically and what it's yeah. Go ahead, Dave. Well, typically what I've seen with those with a great big bubble on that, they, they've had the adhesion is let loose. And so you've got, you know, a, a kind of a flappy roof, but somewhere you've got a slit or a pinhole that allows when you're going down the road, you're getting the air in there and it's, mm -hmm. and that, so that's not good because you're also going to get moisture in there. Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, you were saying inspect that one inch strip. I, I would agree with you hundred percent. They use four by eight sheets of plywood you know, um, or Luon, and you probably got a seam area in there and it's just not adhered to that area mm -hmm. and, and, you know, comes up, you want to make sure it's not leaking. You know, that's, that's the, the key in that is that, that it doesn't get worse and it's not leaking and you don't feel any moisture in it and inspect the inside really well too. Cause you know, the, the unfortunate part about roof leaks is when the, by the time you see them, 
uh, a lot of times it's it's a little too late. <laughs> you yeah. know, they've come through the top and they've made their way somewhere. And then all of a sudden when you see it, you've got a, a little path of destruction, we call it. Yep. So Brett again says Cedar Creek fifth wheel got around 9,000 miles on her four years of travel. How often do I check for brake wear? Uh, the braking is fine now, but so what's your recommendation? Well, I, it depends on what kind of braking system you have on it. So fifth wheel, um, I don't know if Cedar Creek is actually doing um, hydraulic brakes or not. So it changes a little bit with that. But if it's the standard uh, trailer brakes, the manufacturers are generally recommending the brakes are inspected uh, uh, 12 months, 12,000 miles. And uh, if they're not automatic adjusting brakes, they should be uh, readjusted at 3,000 miles yep. um, or uh, as needed for, um, you know, braking efficiency. Yeah. Uh, you've got good braking now. Um, and and they, they tie that together also with bearing service, right? So, um, you know, your bearings need to be repacked also uh, on you know, preferably a, a, a 12 and 12 basis. So that's a good time to inspect yeah. and adjust the brakes. Well, and even, even the... Um... Uh, the bearings now that are greaseless bearings, you know, they, they're saying mm -hmm. that, you, but they still recommend once a year to pull those apart and inspect them, just, you know, look for burnishing or anything inside there. And one of the things that I, that I started doing this, um, I ran a company for 10 years that we had, we built a pressure washer that we put in fast food restaurants and kind of like a, uh, we had it plumbed out and, and I had three guys on the road, uh, trucks and trailers. We had mostly uh, F-350s, diesels and the trailers were about anywhere you know, from six to 12,000 pounds in the first year. Um, and I just, I quit about a year ago doing this, but, uh, ran it for 10 years Had three guys on the road, putting at least a hundred thousand miles a year on those trucks and trailers. And I, that, that very first year we had so many breakdowns out on the road. You know, we had bearings, we had axles, we had tires, we had all this stuff. So I made them start carrying an infrared temperature gun. And mm -hmm. every time they stopped for fuel, they would tell ambient temperature. And I had a chart, ambient temperature, hit that hub, hit that brake drum and hit that tire and tell me what that temperature is at. And it's a lot cheaper to repack bearings in a service center than it is on the side of the road. Oh, no yeah. question about that. You know, and, and so <laughs> what, at that point, you got spindle damage or whatever. You've got to change the, you know, the bearings of if you've you know, cooked all that um, and you're on the side of the road, it's, it can yep. be a, a real challenge. Yeah. So and what, what would... also happens is the, the axle slides, right? So instead of being in line, you know, um, perpendicular with the tra trailer frame, it now moves a little bit because you start getting some play in the wheels and whatever else. Yep. Um, and now you blow out a tire and then you get all the damage from that. And uh, so, yep. yeah. It, it can... Well, and, and, you know, a lot of the two, now that I think about it, we had one guy that loved to set his, auxiliary brake up to 10. He, mm -hmm. he loved the feeling of, you know, every time he brake to hit that, he went through more tires than all the other guys combined because, you know, you put it up that high and, you know, you're going to have the brakes are going to fade faster. The tire is going to slide. To, I mean, he practically came back with square tires almost every time he went out, <laughs> it seemed like. But what that, what that uh, gun will do for you is that you start understanding the normal temperature is going to be, you know, 20, 30 degrees over ambient. That, that, that's not an issue. But now all of a sudden when you see that, that brake drum spike, then you know you got something in that braking system that's not quite right. So, um, you know, that, that, that's kind of my way of making sure that you don't run into problems. Uh, where are we at? Six. We got Chuck. Um, to see, it says we got seven minutes left, Chuck says. All right. Okay. We have, and now it's six. So, so I'm back here with Brett. Ken, did I, whoops, I pulled it up. This trailer was built May 22. That was Ken that had, uh, what did he, I found the leak in 1022. Is he the guy with the? Must have been a pump. pump. Let me, um, yeah, there he is. Can't purchase the Montana. I uh, already had to replace the water pump. Sometimes Never they come freezing down. There. Sometimes they just fail. I mean, it's you can check the torque um, of the, the the two clamshells of the pump with the diaphragm in the middle, but um, yeah, I mean, it just depends. You can have something that cracks. I mean, there's a lot of plastic parts involved. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. That, and I just because you were never in freezing weather doesn't, you know, I, I, I just want to point out that, it's, you know, if, if it was sitting on a dealer lot in, in a cold climate and it wasn't properly winterized or something along those lines, you, know, you didn't. Well, Elkhart is, yeah, they usually are very good about, um, you know, winterizing coaches as needed. But, yeah, you're absolutely right. If it yeah. had some water in it, it could have frozen. It's hard it to It doesn't say. take much for them to, you know, I mean, almost everybody does um, a water test. Uh, manufacturers, you know, um, fill it up and then low point drain and, and stuff like that. But it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's not beyond the realm of possibility that somebody there didn't realize to flush out the, the pump. Yeah. You know, so hopefully it was covered by warranty. If it was a 2022, I get what, you know, my question would be, where was it leaking? Yeah. Right. It, it, that helps to, that'll, that'll sure really identify okay. it. Yeah. I don't see a rash of leaks in, in water pumps. So we got uh, Snoopy and uh, he says, yes, they did still deciding, but that all sounds good. That was um, my recommendation. So here he's mm -hmm. got uh, Snoopy's got six volt batteries have 390 mm -hmm. amps each. Yeah. So you can get size you, different ones. So Tim says, yes, got the rubber ring and thanks. Rubber One other ring. thing, uh, you know, I'm thinking of um, uh, Dave is with regard to uh, axle service and brake service is um, a lot of RVs have uh, bearing buddies mm -hmm. and those I, I, I don't like them. I, I'm not a fan. I've re repaired a lot because what happens is you sit there and you pump grease into it. And when you, you look at a hub, it's a big open cavity inside mm -hmm. in between the bearings that you have to basically fill with grease. And then you're trying to pressurize it to go through. Well, what happens sometimes is on the back of the hub, you hammer in a, a, an axle seal, right? So it's a metal cup and it has a spring loaded rubber gasket in it that goes tightly over the the um, uh, axle spindle. Yep. What happens in, in a lot of cases that I've seen is that the, when you use a bearing buddy, it pushes the grease back through that seal and into the brake cavity behind the hub. Yep. The drum. And yep. then you grease everything inside that and then the brakes don't work anymore. And you're well, basically it, replacing the brakes at that point. Yeah. You know? in, in my opinion, the biggest advantage of the the brake buddy is that it does a great job of greasing the side of the trailer. Yeah. <laughs> Cause it's, yeah. It, we had them on a couple trailers and every time they came back, it was just, I mean, yeah, it was not a good, it was not a good thing. And maybe there was something we were doing wrong, but we just never had any good luck with them uh, as well. Yeah. I'm not a fan. So we're getting, uh, we've got a couple minutes left on DK. What I advice do you give to someone who purchased it feels like I'm in a funeral here. Yeah. <laughs> or church. I gotta, I'm so sorry. Chuck's going to pass. The, you know, I'm Lutheran. All we need to know is how to make a hot dish. You know, it's a, a tater tot casserole. Oh, Christ. That's it. That's it, right? So uh, My wife's Italian. She makes great uh, pasta. We go to the piano. Fifth wheel from a private party and later found out the manufacturer's out of business. You know, that ha has happened Orphan. for so many years. Uh, you know, Manufacturers come and go, and so hopefully, what you would uh, what you would be able to do is almost all the appliances in there. You, you're able to find manuals because they're fairly generic. You got Norcold and Dometic and Thetford and all that stuff, so you should be able to get the that the OEM manuals. And I gotta say that most of the manufacturers, the RV manufacturers manuals, aren't worth much anyway. <laughs> and if you and if you do, you know, do a Google search for the manual for your year and, and make and model and a lot of times sometimes there's owners groups or things like that will that will actually have the um the manual available for download yep. and uh so i have you know we have a, an old lance camper here that we did projects for trailer life and rv enthusiast on and so i ended up printing out you know most of the manuals for it because they, they weren't uh, in the unit yeah and we got it well, we're almost out of time. We got a bunch of questions that came in and we got quite a few people today. We had no hashtag. That was right. Um, Chuck wanted me to leave with a, with a joke. So um, there's this guy that walks into a bar with a dog and he tells the bartender, he says, I have a talking dog here. If he talks for you, will you, will you give me free drinks? The guy says, well, that's pretty good. He said, hey, ask, ask him a question. So Chuck turns up the music. That's good. Ask him a question. He says, okay, what's on top of a house? The dog goes, roof. 
And the guy goes, well, that's stupid. And he said, that's not a talking dog. He said, no, ask him another question. So, okay, who's the greatest baseball player of all time? And the dog goes, root. And the guy goes, get out of here. And he kicks him out. And the dog picks himself up. And he looks at his owner. He goes, what, DiMaggio? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, do you know what a whistling gopher is? Last one. Do you know what a whistling gopher is, Chris? Do I know what a whistling gopher is? No. Yep. It's the old guy that comes to the show and he looks at the biggest, the most outrageous RV there, and he goes up to the salesman. And he goes, "So, what is that unit go for?" And the guy says, "Well, it's four hundred thousand dollars." The guy goes, "Phew! <laughs> That's a whistling <laughs> gopher." There you go. What about that? All right. Well, I appreciate everybody coming out. I'm slow on that laugh track. I appreciate everybody coming out. And Chris, I really appreciate yeah. you joining us. And hopefully you'll be able to do it again more often with us because uh, it's it's nice to have, you know, you and Dustin and guys that are turning wrenches out there and, and helping as much as we can. And you guys, if we didn't get your question in, send us, uh, you know, you got um, my email you can send it to and we'll try to hit it or next week. I will not be here next week. So maybe Dustin and Chris can do that. I am heading to the Harrisburg show and I will not be... Uh, getting there till late so we're going to try and next week maybe do um something from the harrisburg show so keep keep uh, tuned for that with that thank you everybody i appreciate you coming out and have a great rest of what the week is